Today I'm in Portland, Maine. I'll be visiting with Noam Buckman. Noam is a fly fishing guide and a very experienced fly tire. I'm really excited to fish with a fly that we've made. Tell me about the first time you went fly fishing. My neighbor across the street, um, whom was a retired Episcopal priest, um, he had been fly fishing ever since he was 10 years old and he was in the 70s. And um, I decided I wanted to try it and he could give me a lesson. So he did, he gave me a casting lesson and I had to go off and do some work for the rest of the day. And as soon as I got back, I was uh, at the pond that was there across the street and was casting away and uh, decided I liked it enough that I'd take it to the river and went to the river and proceeded to make a very frustrating evening. Yeah. <laughs> no success. No? No, it took a week before I could actually connect with the fish. <laughs> <laughs> but you liked it enough to stick with it. Absolutely. Um, getting the casting down wasn't the hardest part. It was managing line on moving water. What did you like about it? Um, it takes a lot of thought and that intrigued me. I, I like thinking. Um, one of those people where the brain doesn't like to shut off. So it's, it's fun then, you know, because, oh, there's something I can do with my brain. Yeah. <laughs> and keep it busy the whole time. And you get to, I mean, I already loved the outdoors as it was, but it was a great bonus because fish usually don't live in ugly places. So it was nice. Yeah, that's you know, true. You can get to the nice little secret spots and feel like you're alone in the world if you need to, or you can be social. You get the choice. Very true. So when you were learning how to fly fish, what were you doing for a living? I was a, a horticulturalist uh, running a landscape firm. A landscaper? Mm -hmm. Really? And how long did you do that? 20-something years. 23, yeah. 24 years, yeah. But So you enjoyed being outside? Oh, yeah. And the creativity aspect of it? Anything nature-y. I'm very big on learning from the land and from nature. So looking at plants on a landscape can tell me what pH the soil is, as well as all kinds of things, just by what grows. Oh. And you can also tell what kind of porosity the soil has by what particular plants are thriving. They're giving you information all the time. Fishing yeah. is very similar to that aspect. You can look at water and see what plants are growing around it, and it can tell you about pH. It can tell you about a lot of things. Fly fishing is a very natural transition of, you know, detailed content on what each species needs to tick, what makes them happy, what makes them comfortable, um, what makes them safe, what makes them want to eat or not eat, you know, all those little things. Like, you got to learn about them all yeah. to really feel like you know enough to, to go after and try to attempt to fool them which is what we're doing, you know? <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, fool them, mm -hmm. right? At what point did you decide you were gonna become a guide? I think when I started to feel very comfortable on regularly finding and catching fish. Okay. Um, I felt like I understood the system enough where I could then teach somebody else about the system. Okay and have at least enough exposure and good possibilities of success rate for the client. How did you get involved with tying flies? It took a few years. Yeah. I was real busy with trying to figure out the whole system. <laughs> <laughs> that took a while. And then once you start to catch fish consistently and you run out of flies frequently and you can't get resupplied from the local shop or, you know, can I get this in a, a just like a size or two smaller or can I get this in just a little lighter olive? And you begin to realize that flies are more national rather than dialed into the local waters. Can you explain what you mean to me by that? So local waters, a lot of times will have uh, either smaller or larger flies than what the national chain offers. Okay. So most fly shops will buy national flies in, but they'll also have local tires to help supplement for those oh, oh, oh. local adjustments of bugs that okay. they have, whether it be size, color, even species, like it could be anything. Um, that kind of fascinated me, that and I couldn't get 
my resupply fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> my dealer just wasn't dealing. <laughs> so I decided, okay, I better start learning how to tie these. So I actually tied more out of necessity than creativity. And then after like, oh, this is fun. Like there is a color palette you can really play with, you know, kind of same in the gardening and color palettes, you know, get to run with. And then, then the explosion happens after you get past the productive part. Oh. Then the creative side just like, whoo, and then you go, all right, let's play. So did you, I mean, do some workshops? Did somebody teach you how to tie? Did you buy a bunch of books? And um, I like had a local to... shop at the time that had uh, what we would call fly tying groups. And actually, funny enough, we would it'd be on the weekends and we'd usually get there around nine or 10 and then flying and tying and lying situation, you know, your fish <laughs> stories. So, you know, you do learn some good intel from some other local fishermen too, and you yeah. sometimes get new friends, but tying with somebody is, is, is an interesting thing, much like fishing with somebody, you can learn quite a bit. And how did that come about, like the fly tying business? At what point did you decide that this was gonna be a business for you? Just decided to make it happen I, after leaving Michigan uh, and moving back to the east here on the coast. Um, the muskie that I was guiding for in Michigan are six, seven hours away from me now. And it's just not, I don't want a second life away from my spouse. So I said, like, All right, let's try this and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. That's all you can do, right? You know, I could fall back on horticulture if I have to, but, uh, this is fine and it's working at the moment. Sure. sure. So I'll stick with it. This is incredible. This is really a work of art. Thank you. And what, what is it called? It's called El Capitan. El Capitan. I like that. And what would you fish for with this? Uh, we're tying intentionally today. If we're going to be tying for stripers, but this is actually a all around classic bait fish pattern. It's a, just a white with an olive back bait fish. So how do we start? Like we've got a lot of materials in this. We do. We have a couple of different materials in this, um, but all flies, they, you start from the very back of the hook and then work your way and finish in the front. So the, usually the longest or the last uh, applied material is how we start. So we're going to, we're going to start with these white feathers right back here. This That's is the tail. So exciting. Cause I get to make something and then later it, fish, with, fish it. with it. Right. It's going to be awesome. So here's our hook. Now what kind of hook is this? These are uh, Gamagatsu's B tennis. Tennis, okay. And they have the nickel finish, which is really good for salt water. And what size is this? Uh, this is a three odd. Okay. And we're going to want to make sure my hand is going to mimic the vise for a second. We're going to make sure we want the vise to pinch it like so, and that the shank is straight. So the shank should always be level. Yeah. Okay. Dead level. Level like yeah. this. Okay. As level as possible. All right. So we're going to grab our thread. Uh, there's two size threads here. We're going to grab the, the, yeah, that one there one? is a thicker thread. We're going to start with that and we're going to finish with the thinner thread. And what's this device called? A uh, bobbin. This is a bobbin. Mm -hmm. Okay. The secret with the bobbin is that what we're going to be doing is um, on either side of the brass knobs that mm -hmm. hold it. This is where we're going to palm to apply pressure ah. to not let the thread out. And then we're going to ease up on it so that we can allow line to come out. Uh, okay, I got it. I got it. Yep. yep. Just a little bit of squeeze motion there. Yep. yep. And then you can squeeze it to stop it. Yep. Okay. There's no knots until the very end. Okay. So it's all about tension and lashing down. Okay. And maintaining tension. So we're going to do what's called tagging on. So... Should I bring this back? The, yep. You want to roll it right up? So we're going to tag on roughly about the middle of the shank. Okay. So you want the tag to the left. And you're okay. going to be behind the hook. Okay. And then you're going to start rotating up and over two two wraps forward or three, whichever you prefer. Okay. Now I want you to back wrap, which is tilting the line the opposite way and come all the way back and on top of what's called the tag that you've left behind. So once you backtrack onto the tag enough, you can do this and it won't go anywhere. Now you're, you're tagged on. It's official. Look at now that. Now we can grab our scissors. You don't want to cut, you just want to rake. 
with it. Okay. So hold it and rake. All this is going to be hidden, so we're not going to see. Okay. And then I tend to do a few more wraps back to secure. Now we're going to move to the middle. We're going to go forward to the middle of the hook. Forward. Yep. Excellent. Perfect. Like this? Yep. You're doing a great job. So now we're going to pull out. These are um, Chinese strung hen feathers. Oh, boy. Those are in there. Yeah. Sometimes they are. Let's do it this way. We're going to pick two. Oh, there you go. What we're going to do is we're going to lay them so there's a convex and concave side. You want to make sure they're matched however you want. The tips, the very tips, we want to measure out exactly the same. So once those tips are measured out, okay. then we're going to come back. And if there's anything uneven, we're going to trim that and clean it up. I'm going to take about a quarter of an inch off. So now what we're going to do is in the example fly, you can see there's two ways to do feathers. You can do prayer style uh -huh. or you could do reverse prayer, which uh, are what these are. Those and are now reversed. it's kind of like the parachute that comes out of the race car at the end. So they're going to squeeze down when the tension of stripping it in and then they're going to pop out and then cause the fly to stall oh. Oh, right, and turn. Right. Oh, okay, 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 cool. So now we're going to do reverse prayer. So just take it and... Yep. Match them up. Now you always have the reverse prayer. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so now this is just going to... The pair of them are going to just sit on top of the hook right over where your thread is. So just do several good wraps and we want some good tension on there. And then if there's any part of the stem still there, I just go ahead and lash the rest of that down. Just lash just, it over? Yep. Clean it up. Keep them still. They're all going to stay nice and tight now. All right. We're going to do bucktail. And I've got your, you've got your own tail. And I'm going to do my tail because I'm going to show you how to cut. So bucktail itself, there's three different kinds of materials. The bottom third is full of air. The middle third has a little bit of air. The very tip has no air in it whatsoever. And what I mean what are mean the hollow tubes. You can even see it when you look at the detail of the hair closest to the bottom it has. So this is the insulation to protect the deer. Oh, okay. So it has more insulation and the further away the tail goes and dangles, right? So that you don't need the insulation so they don't grow those kinds of hairs. Poor deer. <laughs> we want the bottom third to the second third, somewhere in that zone. We want some air. Right in here. Yep. Okay. I had absolutely no idea that different sections of hair within a bucktail would react differently in the water. Understanding that using different sections is going to make it react differently, you almost have to isolate the materials. Like, oh, look at this stuff floats differently than this stuff does. And now that I think about it, that knowledge in and of itself just seems really, really old. So we're going to take the material. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to reverse tie. So we're going to spin it in our hands. And don't worry if the stack gets a little unruly. And we're going to apply it like so, if that makes sense to you. Apply it to the front. Okay. Yep. But we want, we want the thread to come in about a quarter of an inch. So now I'm going to switch hands now that I know my position is correct, where my thumbs are pinched in front of the thread holding the material. The thread's going to come up between my fingers and I'm going to pinch it. Okay. And then I'm not going to let the thread down until it's under the shank. And what I'm going to explain to you before doing this is if you were to cinch down a stack of two by fours, you don't want to pull on it you know, if they're all straight up in a stack. You don't want to pull on it when it's just off to the side. You want to pull on it once it wraps from underneath. Right, 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 to right. Squeeze to squeeze the tension down. down. Right. So that's exactly what we're doing here with this pinch method is we're going to hold the thread okay. until the bobbin can get under the hook shank. And then once you get to that point, then you're just going to lift up and cinch down the material. Okay. And then once you've cinched it down, then two or three more wraps on top of it to secure it. Does that make sense? I think so. I'm not sure I did this right. Let me take a look. So I would do a couple more wraps tight. Don't hold the material. Just go ahead and wrap tight. Yep. There you go. Let it rotate. Okay. Now you're good. Definitely. 
So now we have this really high-end expensive tool, which oh. is just a pen shank. Ah, okay. And we're going to stick it over the eye of the hook, and right. we're going to push all that material back. And this is called reversed bucktail tying. Oh, oh, like that. Okay. Yep. And then it just holds it back so that you can get a good hand on it. And then what we're going to do is put a bump of thread in the front and then hopefully catching a few of the fibers to help hold the stack still. All right. That's so cool. We're going to put in a little of this. Disco. <laughs> <laughs> a very tiny amount. Sometimes sparing flash works best. A little bit more, I think. There we go. This is like... Yep, and we're going to... What's called folding over the flash to secure it. So we're going to tie it in at the very middle point. Okay. So we find it by kind of hanging it down to see where that middle point is. Okay. And then we're going to... Right where the thread lays. Have half of it laying over. And half of it in the front. Half of it in the front, right. And then we're just doing a couple of thread wraps. You can do the pinch if your material wants to move around on you, like we just did. Yep. Okay. Okay, and then once you've gotten a couple of wraps, you know it's secure, then we're going to fold the flash back. Okay. And then wrap on top of both of them, and that will secure that it won't pull out. And now a different color. Yep. And then what we want to do is taper, always taper the ends of your flash. Nothing should be blunt or ah, it okay. won't be organic looking. And then we're going to tie in at the halfway point of that. Yep. So half in and then fold the other half. And you'll notice this is a bit wider um, and it's shorter. So it's only going to stay in front of the bucktail because of the shorter length. Oh, look how cool that looks. Man, that looks really cool. <laughs> Starting to come to life. Yeah, it is. All right. Now we have this other ingredient. What's this? This is new secret stuff. Uh-oh. <laughs> Proprietary? It is. OK. Custom blended. Mm. And this it, is my. It's uh, surprising. It's very little material that's used. Right. And it's know? more the depth. You want to create depth. So, okay. and then of course, it's all about color as well. And that's your half of my okay. new shimmer. This is pretty. It's a shimmery gloss. So this is going to give it that olive back, which is great color for classic bait fish pattern. Oh, I see, I see. Right. So it's it's now what, what, what we're doing is we've made it really fancy and bright and shiny. Now we're going to dull it a little with some natural color that has a natural shimmer to it. So again, halfway point. Okay. And then this is going to then add the super depth of color to that flash. And then we're going to spread out the first batch before folding. Okay. Good. And then we're going to fold back. Spread the back out? Yeah, so I spread the back one out evenly because this is more of an overall color we're trying to achieve with it. Okay. Just over the top half of the fly. Yep. And then fold it over and tie in. And then I typically use a, a pet brush to give it a little blending to try to get the flash to come together with that new shimmer product. And just like... Yeah, so you can see there's purple highlights then in the back of the oh, yeah. olive, which is very classic bait fish colorations. Man, that looks awesome. But it's great with the stripers. They like that. All right. Now we're going to have the wing. So we've got the tail, the middle of the body. We're going to put a wing on. Then we're going to put uh, a white base over and then eyes at the end. Oh, cool. So if there's any missed what, length, what kind so of we're going to. So this is rooster. Rooster. This is a uh, grizzly. Look how pretty that is. Yes. It adds that little bit of punch. So much like what we did with the tail feathers to measure them out to make sure that they were both identical, we matched the tips up 
Once the tips are matched, then we go back to the stems. If they're off in measurement, that's where you clip them to uh, level them up so that they're both identical. Okay. Now, as you can see with the example fly, we want, so there's a color side and then there's a dull side. We want to make sure the color side stands out. Oh, okay. So on each side, we're going to apply these one by one. So the, there's a flat stem in this feather and it's best if it runs parallel with the shank. Okay. And it won't twist as much, if that makes sense. Yep. So we're going to tie it in parallel with the shank and you want to tie in about a little more than a, than a quarter inch. And That's then once right. you have one side, now we're going to tilt your vise. Yep. So now you're going to tie on that side, which you're looking at the fly upside down. But it's very handy for applying wings and eyes. So lash her down pretty good. Okay. There you go. I think I got it. Yep. Yep. That look all right? Yep. Okay. So to loosen them up, because yours are a little tight, you can see it's compressing. Uh -huh. What you're going to take is you're going to hold the stem area and just pull it up and it'll allow it to stay out without breaking that stem. Yeah, there you go. That's it. Then it'll come out a little bit and fluff out a little more, more of a V shape. All right. So we're going to do our last bit of bucktail. We're oh, going to draw from the same place like we did before. Okay. We want roughly the same quantity, so we're going to pull it over the center to make sure it's all even, and then trim. Pinch up, hold it, don't draw tension until you're under the shank. So, since it's hair, and we're just going to manage hair with this hair clip, put it around the bobbin. Okay. Slide it all the way up and over the eye. Oh. And it'll clean everything out of your way all in one fell swoop. Yep. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> now you can go ahead and uh, clean up and put thread tracks in front of your bucktail. Okay. And you don't want to wrap too much. You just want enough to clean up your areas because we have one final material to add. And am I going over the bucktail also? Just a tiny bit, just, just to push it so it lays back. You don't want to just, you know, kind of mash down in that sense. You just want to build a little ramp up from the shank all the way up to the hair. Uh, what we're going to add next is the eye. All right, cool. We're going to add the classic eyes okay. uh, before the fake eyes came out. We're going to actually use what's called uh, jungle cock. Yeah, these just look like eyes. Right? Fly tying in and of itself is a very creative endeavor. The ability to see an eye within a larger feather and take all these different miscellaneous materials and put them together to mimic a bait pretty special. So what we're going to do is these little microfibers. First, we're going to put our finger over and protect the part we want. Okay. And then we're going to kind of tease the softer stuff out and away so that you can see I've separated the eye out from all the other hairs. So adjust the eye is available. Then you're going to take your left hand, you're going to cover the good part, which is going to leave the bristly part hanging out for you to easily grab. And then you're just going to pluck and pull opposite to the stem, which means you're going to pull downward and it'll strip it away without hurting the eye. And then you'll just be left with a nice clean eye. And then much like we laid in the wing 
Mm -hmm. the grizzly wing. We're going to lay this in the same way to the side of the shank. We don't want it on, on top or, or down below. We want it right on the side so it looks like eyeballs on the side of the fish. Up and over. And you want to make sure it's good and tight. Need a couple more wraps. We lift the material up and snip away. And then we're going to do what's called cleaning the head. So now is the time when any of the little stragglers or extraneous stuff gets pushed. Oops. A little too tight. So what we're going to do is the knots now. The pen in your right hand, the thread in your left hand, and you want the narrow end of the pen. So reverse it. Yeah, there you go. You're going to put two wraps around the pen, mm -hmm. and then you're going to rotate the pen up to the eye and then you're going to slide the knot over it. And that's a half hitch. So that's one knot. You could do it again, which would doubly knot it, and then you could call then it'd yourself be a full hitch. Then it'd be a full hitch and then you then you're all set. Or if you're feeling up to it and again, this is up to you. This is a whip finish tool which ties knots under itself. If you hold this bead, it mm -hmm. won't spin. But as soon as you go onto the brass, it's going to spin freely, which... So you hook, notch, mm -hmm. slide. So I'm going to point it right at the eye, and I've got my triangle when I lift it up. This part of the triangle is the only part that's going to come in contact. Then when we lift up, that's when it's going to slide off on purpose. Okay. And then we loosen it. Then you rake off. All right, so this is kind of like fingernail polish UV glue. Okay. It's very thin. So it comes with a small <laughs> little bit. Okay. And we're just gonna paint like fingernail polish real thin. Don't need a super thick. And then you're gonna take your UV. Hold it on there for a bit. Yep. And there you go. So now the end gets real hot. So you That's just a line kinda, cutter, right? Yes. Oh. So you can see it's well loved and used because there are times you just end up with a messy head that you get to clean up. There you go. You just want to be able to get to your eye, more or less. This is not a nice smell. No. <laughs> <laughs> Burning materials never good. It's not. <laughs> All right. All right. Then you should be able to take that off. Wow. Looks good. That is really cool. It's really cool that these fly patterns are basically recipes. So somebody designs this fly pattern for one particular area. Now taking that recipe and actually creating a fly that works the way it's supposed to is where the real skill sets in. Right? You can't just take these materials and haphazardly put them together, throw it out there and start catching fish. You need to know how to take these materials and correctly apply them to the hook so that it acts the way it's supposed to act and mimic what it's supposed to mimic. On top of that, you also need to be able to tell how to change that recipe, tweak it so that it's good for your local fishery. Maybe changing the hue of the colors a little bit or using just a little bit different material so that it acts proper for your fish. Man, all those skills take time and effort to learn and develop. It's pretty impressive. Now, are you mostly concentrating on predator flies? Predators. Now, predators aren't just pike and muskie. Predators are anything that's the top consumer of fish eating fish right. in the systems you're in. So, so it could like be bass. stripers, bass, okay. it could be trout, um, but the flies that we have typically are a little larger. Trout are usually the bait size. So, <laughs> 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 What is it that you like about those particular flies? Um, they're, they're really nice to cast. Yeah. Um, I've spent a lot of time when I was guiding, I had a lot of people who were new to musky fishing and to get them comfortable casting to the muskie all day, it's it's a long, hard thing. And 
I didn't want them fatigued, you know, within the first hour or two. So I designed a lot of flies that were real simple, easy to cast. I also surveyed the water I was on. This is really what curtailed me. And the bait size. So there's a lot of pan fishermen, and I got to know them on a first name basis quite well. Yeah. And uh, I'd say, hey, Roy, can I, can I come check out what you got in your bucket today? And he's, oh, sure. Take a peek, take a peek, because I like to see color, size, uh... and shape. That's the primary food. And what the primary size was, was the sweet spot was six to eight inches is the sweet spot. You want to know everything you can to help you catch sure. about the species. And the more you know, then the more you'll have really educated guesses on things. Musky flies, because of the way that predator likes to consume things, they like to have what's called a full-on profile. If you're the fish, I'm the angler, and I'm stripping or even retrieving in any way, shape, or form, it's running straight. Right. But with the way musky flies are engineered, because they're using the lower third portion of a lot of bucktail, which has air in it, as well as that reverse tying of those feathers, all of that is engineered so that on the pause, while after you strip, you come up to grab more line, it does this in between us. Ah, and gives right. a full profile shot every pause, every time you go to do this. Or if you were to use like crankbaits in that sense, every time you jerk and then pause, does the same thing. Well, flies started doing that for musky. But oh. now it's coming. I'm definitely doing it here. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm definitely bringing that here because I want that side movement, that profile shot for the stripers. They love that. Yeah. So you don't have to, you're not altering your, your stripping or pausing or anything like no, that. No, the engineering's yeah. in the fly. The fly does all the work now. That's super so, cool. Do you ever look at yourself or think about yourself in the terms of being a craftsman or an artist? No, I've never really looked at it that way. No? No, and I've, I've had people who want to frame things and I'm, I've always been puzzled by it. Yeah. I'd like, I'd rather fish it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd much rather fish it. Right. You know, and if I give somebody a fly, oh, I won't fish this. And I was like, please do. Yeah, use you know, it. Use it. That's that's what the fun part it's is a tool. for. Yeah. It's just a beautiful I guess that's tool. the thing I see it more as a functional. Sure. It's art, too. It's not to say that I don't appreciate it. I won't think some are really pretty, but none are too pretty for me to fish ever. <laughs> I get that. I understand that. <laughs> no. Do you ever think about your legacy? No. No? No. I mean, I, I have friends who, you know, are very grateful for the help and assistance, but I don't know. Maybe I've touched enough. I don't know. Well, I think it's because, right, as a guide and as a tire, a fly tire, you're, you get to impact so many other people's lives, mm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and you're helping them form memories mm. and maybe you're introducing them to something that is going to impact and change their life the same way that that gentleman changed your life i mean yeah. completely completely upset your life yeah. and changed the direction of your life just by teaching you how to fly fish you know so in that with, regard like with that in mind i'd say yeah for the past 11 years i've been uh helping out in the driftless area of wisconsin there's a uh, women's fly fishing clinic that oh. happens every year. And we have 20 something students that come completely new, may have never fished before in their life to camp for the weekend with us and learn intensively about fly fishing for trout. And there I see a dramatic change within the weekend sure. in, their, in their lives. And you can see that they fall in love with it. And then it's something that they're going off on a journey with. That I'd say, yeah, that's probably the biggest Part of that legacy I probably would have is those kinds of educational moments that I've had with people. See, I think that's amazing. I'm ready to test out those flies. I'll be honest with you. I'm <laughs> think it's time? Chomping at the bit a little bit. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. You ready? <laughs> oh, yeah, always. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> All right. I was so impressed with Gnome's 
observation abilities. She went from horticulture where she could look at plants and tell what the pH level of the soil was or even what could grow in that area to taking that skill set and applying it to fishing. And that really came to light when we were sitting on the boat. I watched her as she was looking over, reading the water, looking at the birds, listening to the wind. She was paying attention to everything around her in order to study where we should go fishing. It was meaningful to me because it made me think about my day-to-day -day as a craftsman. Being mindful of what's around me and reading that and using that knowledge properly. There's a story going on around us all the time. Whether I'm in my shop or outside working, there's so many other things that I need to be paying attention to and open my mind up to see that. It's something I'll be working on for many years, I think.